Hello everybody, it's Fossil Friday, you are joining us here at the Paleocast Gaming Network and we're going to be playing T-Rex Time Machine, which is a... Uh, how would you describe it? It's a text-based adventure, you know, kind of like those choose-your-own-adventure books that you used to get when you were little. I don't know if you played those, read those. But someone made one as the computer game, so it falls within our remit. You know, paleontology, computer games. So even though it is essentially like, you know, just like a, an ebook, there, there is some computer gamery in there, and you can buy it on Steam and whatnot for just a few quid. Uh, so here we have it, and we're going to play with it. So um, if anyone's about, can you let us know if the audio is coming through okay? Because of course I've been having audio issues all day. And it would be good to just get that confirmation that it's not awful before we start. Because I don't think, you know, like, going through an audiobook <laughs> when nobody can hear is a particularly good idea. But, anyway, um... It would be good to get that before I start. Uh, and then, just in general, we're going to be working through, and wherever... Oh, thanks, Scaff. Very much appreciated. So, whenever we've got a, a choice to make in this book, I shall be referring to uh, you, the viewers. So, you're going to have to guide where we're going with this. And... Yeah, it's, it's all going to be on your your heads, so I don't know if it's going to work particularly because the character isn't going to be very consistent. Um, so they might end up with, you know, like multiple personalities as we all collaboratively decide what's going to happen to the protagonist. But hey, we're going to see how it works. I've got a soundboard as well. It might be the worst thing that's ever happened. But we're going to give it a go. So, if you want to just uh, put in, say, like, one, two, three, four, or your rationale for whichever answer you want to do, uh, then please go ahead. If not, I'll just decide. So, anyway, starting off. We'll stop that. T-Rex Time Machine by Rosemary Claire Smith. Academic Disaster. You race across campus on foot towards the university's admin building, woefully late. How could you have lost track of the time on the most important day in your entire academic career? Of course, it doesn't help that the university placed its student parking lots halfway to Outer Mongolia. Maybe you've been focusing your energies on the wrong project. Wouldn't it be more sensible to devise a practical means of local teleportation across town or across campus? rather than multi-million year time travel. You shake your head, no way. It's better to stick with your true passion. For longer than you can remember, you've poured your heart and soul and time and money into your dream. Nothing intrigues me more than building and operating a time machine. It's worth a few risks to learn about living dinosaurs. A time machine is merely the means to go and make movies about real dinosaurs. A time machine will let me explore the Mesozoic wilderness and hunt dinosaurs. So, who are we going to be? Oh, sorry about the chat, Paul. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird one. I had to stick it into kind of like um, a subscriber only, just so that we could get rid of all the spam bots. And also it makes everyone subscribe. So, genius idea. So, come on, who, who are we? Are we, I guess, an engineer? Are we a paleontologist, a movie maker, or a hunter? What's what's our rationale for going back in time? Uh, I guess it probably wouldn't matter too much at this stage anyway, so... I think maybe we will stick it as just a straight up paleontologist for now. When you close your eyes, you can practically see, hear, and smell the hot breath 
of an immense Cretaceous herbivore. There's so much we don't know about their appearances, life cycles, diets, mating strategies, habitats, and so on. Sure, there are risks inherent in time travelling to a place where dinosaurs roam, but it's worth it for the chance to study the most magnificent beasts that ever strode upon planet Earth, dominating every continent for over 160 million years. Actually, it would be an indisputably better idea for you to focus your attention on the impending challenge. You've waited weeks for today's make-or-break meeting with the Dean of Students, mentally rehearsing what you intend to say to get yourself out of this mess. You did nothing wrong. Not only that, but you're a good student, double majoring in zoology and engineering with a minor in film. The trouble is, everyone thinks you cheated. Everyone except for Brett. That's your best friend and the only person you can really confide in. The only person with whom you can kick back and just be yourself. You smile inwardly as you think of Brett. With his crooked grin, mischievous eyes and encouraging words, or with her easygoing, spontaneous laugh, sparkling eyes and sound advice. So Brett, man or woman? Well, Scaff's gone for man already, so there we go. Brett's a guy. And and get your answers in early. I mean, you can like see the answers before I've uh, managed to get up to there, so. It's great to know uh, Brett will always have your back. He not only shares your dream of building the world's first time machine, he's also spent hour upon hour helping you do just that. You're ever so close to success, you just know it. Think of it, you could co become the first person to ever travel backward to another era. Ha! Barely in your 20s, you could become a world-famous woman, the next Amelia Earhart. A world-famous man, the next Neil Armstrong. Or just a world-famous person. I don't identify as either a man or a woman. So we, uh, woman, man, or neither. Oh wow, I think we've uh, got a bit of a lag on the answers to these. It'll be interesting. Type lag in the comment, and then you'll see if it's like a minute or something. Um, well, seeing as Brett is a guy, I think we might be a woman. Keep it even. So, Amelia Earhart. Like Amelia Earhart, you'll soar off into the unknown and show the world what can be done. Though naturally, you intend to avoid a mysterious disappearance and probable death at an early age. Yeah, that is like 30 seconds on the lag. I'll have to go really slow. Um, but yeah, a 20? 20 is a ridiculously early age to be, you know, like, the, the first person to ever invent a time machine. It's, uh, uh it's pretty... <laughs> pretty impressive. You know, if you're still at university, you'd expect someone to be, like, a professor, uh, the most famous academic in the whole world, if they're capable of, you know, like, making something that gets you through into the past time machine, it's crazy. Uh, the stopped clock atop the uh, Carillon Tower reads 17 past the hour, causing you to wince inwardly as you pick up the pace. A couple of your engineering school classmates warned you that the Dean of Students puts great stock in punctuality. This could be your only chance to defend your good name against the false charges. But first, you may well have to explain your tardiness. That prospect makes your back muscles stiffen into knots. What if you said your old car broke down? Wow, does that ever sound lame? Besides, the Dean has probably heard every excuse imaginable. You could come clean and tell the truth. How's that for an idea? Yes, although I'm in intimidated by him, I'm proud of my honesty. No way, I'm too scared. I can pull off an excuse. Nope, if he asks, I'll stand up to him. It's none of his business. Music's a bit loud. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I will turn the music down. I have that ability. Taking it down a couple of notches. So let me know how that sounds relative. Right, you both want three. Uh, nope, if he asks, I'll stand up to him. It's none of his business. You take a breath, relax your back muscles and square your shoulders. A simple apology for lateness ought to be sufficient. You won't go through life letting people with fancy titles push you around or sit in judgment over you. That's just the way you've always operated, no matter the consequences. What exactly were you doing that caused you to lose track of time? Working alone on a tantalizing new design for my time machine. Reading an intriguing theory that duck-billed dinosaurs ra raise their young much like birds do. Brett and I were watching a dinosaur adventure movie to get some pointers for my own filmmaking. Or I was checking out Brett's new rifle. Music audio sounds great now. Good. I'm very glad. So I got some fancy new software that'll take care of everything, hopefully with the audio. So like, yeah, also if, 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 if everything's kind of like working, the chat looks like it's working, the... My little voice in the bottom left, that's cool. That's something new I tried out, and that seems to be working. And hopefully the text is big enough and not overlaid by anything that you can read it all. So, two, you need two, we, we want the hadrosaurs. Dinosaurs are endlessly fascinating. You clearly remember seeing your first hadrosaurus skeleton in a museum when you were in preschool, and you've been enraptured by them ever since. The more you learn, the more wondrous they seem. And yet picturing the Dean, you quail at the likelihood he'll presume you're trying to lie to him. <laughs> so that's out. As you turn over some other approaches in your mind, you spot a couple of familiar students. They're a study in opposites. Short, overweight, long-haired Casey is an outgoing paleontology PhD student with Asian features, while tall, scrawny Skylar with Northern European features and a blonde buzz cut is a reserve engineering student. You had been impressed with a talk Casey gave on Hadrosaurus dentition and peppered Casey with questions afterwards. You got to know Skylar from taking several classes together. Later on, you spotted them hanging out with Darian Vance, the person who has caused you so much grief. Casey is saying to Skylar, actually done it. I've signed on with Darian. The mention of your enemy distracts you. Thrown off your stride, you step on some dead leaves clumped on the path, not realizing that they're slippery. Your feet come out from under you, splashing cold, dirty water on your jeans as you fall. Ouch. You're okay. Casey extends a hand to help you. I snap at Vance's buddies to drive them away. Feeling embarrassed and awkward, I jump up. Or I make a joke at my own expense and let them help me, hoping they'll resume their conversation. Yeah, three is definitely the least cringe, so... Nothing in injured but my dignity, you reply, taking Casey's hand. You're bleeding. Skylar points to the dirty knee poking through the fresh hole in your jeans. Just a bit of a scrape, you answer. Casey holds your water bottle while Skylar scoops up your cell phone, which thankfully hasn't cracked. You take a couple of minutes to thank them for helping you collect your stuff and to assure them that you're really all right. They may be Vance's friends, but that doesn't justify rudeness. As they continue on their way, Casey turns to Skylar and resumes their previous conversation. If Darian can actually get the machinery to... Skylar interrupts. He doesn't have the expertise, what if you were to help? I don't. You're curious, but by now they're too far away for you to hear anymore. You can hardly reverse course and eavesdrop. Plus, you're later than ever. Damn, this is, n this is not how to impress the Dean of Students. You remember being told he also prizes neatness. 
You brush off the last of the clinging leaves while trotting towards the administration building. A study in mid-century neoclassical pomposity. The nearest set of doors is flooded with people exiting. It seems to take forever to weave through the cheery throng of undergrads. You make it inside and reach the elevators to find them both out of order, drat. Dean Green's office is on the fifth floor. You head for the stairs and start up them. I tell you what, there is so many stairs in university and you have so many meetings and you just end up having to walk up endless flights of stairs. You get to the top and yeah, you are absolutely sweating everywhere. I've been in that boat so many times. And like, it, regardless of whether you're fit or not, you know, you go for a meeting with a professor and you got to climb up like four flights of stairs first. I feel this pain. Uh, it's got the rat in, so uh, go faster. Um, sure, let's let's get extra extra sweaty. Um, yeah. Although you uh, prize balance in your life, sometimes you think it would make more sense to worry less about fitness and really devote yourself wholeheartedly to your overriding passions. Then again, you're loath to give up your camping trips with Brett, which have produced treasured memories. Your best friend shares your love of the outdoors and recently introduced you to trail running. Brett's a natural athlete, a trained paramedic, and something of an ad adrenaline junkie. He's also a fine shot. He? Yeah, he, and we're she. Okay, I've <laughs> forgotten the story already. He's also a fine shot with pistol or rifle. You viv vividly record, uh, bleh, can't speak. You vividly recall last year's camping trip up along the ridge, miles from anywhere, when a deadly rattlesnake slithered into your campsite. Brett's back was turned when his dog started towards the ta snake, tail wagging. Before the rattler could strike, feeling confident, I raised my rifle and took a shot. Rather than chance it, I yelled to Brett, who is a more experienced shooter. Stay! I calmly ordered the dog. I don't want any bloodshed. Ever. I don't know what I would do in that situation. I mean, I've come across many snakes and stuff on actual field work, and like climbing around doing field geology being in the mountains and stuff it you do come across quite a few snakes never had one like in my tent before but i think i think you can get around it i don't think that it's necessarily that you have to kill it or anything like that so i probably wouldn't i would I probably wouldn't even ask my friend to shoot it any either. I'd just be like, let's leave until the snake isn't there. I don't know if that's just me. You had the cool presence of mind to try to defuse the situation immediately. Fact is, you had only pointed a gun at uh, a living thing one time, but you didn't shoot. You doubt that you ever could. Brett's a different story. When that dumb dog ignored your command and kept heading for trouble, your closest friend had no qualms about raising his rifle and dispatching the snake. You felt bad about the serpent, but you could hardly fault Brett's snap decision uh, to protect his dog. While ascending the stairs, you remember your best friend's words of encouragement when you said you'd fight this injustice. He's the only person in your life who knows about your secret project to build a time machine. You and Brett have been inseparable since grade school, when you played together with toy dinosaurs. You finally reach the Dean of Students office, which is guarded by a receptionist who purses her lips at you and pointedly glances at the wall clock. Oh, I got a clock. Audio. She tells you to take a seat as she heads into the Dean's office. You wait. She comes out, closes the door, and leaves you cooling your heels. Through the closed door, you can hear the rumble of the Dean's bass voice pronouncing your name, which is... Uh, Chris, Jamie, Emma, Lindsay, or something else. I feel like we should be able to come up with something amusing. Think Emma? Uh, there must be some paleo pun somewhere in there. 
Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with Emma. Lindsay. Alright, uh, let's go with Lindsay. I don't think it will really matter to the story, to be honest. When are we getting a time machine? Also, there's mention of T-Rex and a time machine, and we've not done either yet. Unfortunately, the mention of your name behind that foreboding mahogany door provokes laughter. That's pretty mean. You wince. Who's in there with the Dean? Forcing yourself to listen more closely while trying to be unobtrusive, you can make out the distinctive accent of Professor Thorne, who teaches temporal physics. She's the one who flunked you. You hadn't expected her, but it makes sense that she'd be there. There's a third voice, male, that sounds familiar, but you can't quite place it. They make you cool your heels some more. How do you spend your time? Wipe blood and dirt from my knee, but don't ask the receptionist for a band-aid. Flip through my temporal physics lab book, rehearsing how I made my big discovery. Or switch on the inconspicuous camera peeking out from my pocket and silently rehearse my plea for justice. What's that last one? Why would you have a camera in your pocket? Uh, we need some more background music. Let's go for that one again. Uh, well, if it was me, I'd probably maybe get myself all cleaned up. I mean, I'm sweaty. I'm covered in dirt and blood. It's not a good look. I mean, if, you, if you're clever enough to invent a time machine, you're gonna be on top of your temporal physics anyway. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, blood. Let's get that off. Your scraped knee sure could use a wipe uh, with a clean cloth, some antiseptic cream and a band-aid, but the receptionist's sour expression halts your tongue. Anyway, there's little you can do now about the mud smeared from the hem of your pants up to the knee. You try crossing your legs in a way that will make it less conspicuous. At last, you are summoned. Behind an outsized dark wooden desk sits a, bull, a big bald man frowning at the rumpled paper before him. It's your letter protesting your final grade in temporal physics. The brass nameplate on the desk reads Dr. Emery Green. Disgust curls in the Dean's lip as he throws his monogrammed pen down at your letter. You begin to understand why everyone calls him Dean Me. <laughs> uh, you look to the side. There's Professor Thorne, seated in an overstuffed brown leather chair by the window. Her cold eyes narrow, and so do her lips when she looks at you. And then you notice the other two people in the room. Oh no! Sitting next to the glass-fronted wooden bookcase is your nemesis. Darian Vance. He's the bad person who lifted a copy of your temporal physics notes containing your nearly completed proof of concept and turned it into Pro Professor Thorne as his own work and she refused to believe you uh, when it was your word against Vance's. You heard through the grapevine that Vance bragged about getting an A while Thorne gave you an F. Why is everyone bamboozled by Vance's thoughtful and charming act? You learn the hard way, what a glib, lying, conniving schemer he is. Worse yet, he's here with his wealthy father, a major booster for the football team. They named the stadium after him last year. From their comfortable seats, father and son favor you with nearly identical displays of contemptuous confidence that does nothing to mar their blood, uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed good looks. Greet D uh, Dean Green and Professor Thorne, but demand Vance leaves, uh, leaves. Pointedly ignore the Vances and say, Good afternoon, Dean Green, Professor Thorne. Give the Vances barely civil nods, but greet Dean... It's so hard to say Dean Green and Professor Thorne by name. Um, in that situation, oh, I guess they should be there because, uh, I mean, we're suspected of plagiarizing Darian Vance's work. But, you know, if, if you don't have the, the physics, the research backing up you saying that someone has plagiarized my work, 
I mean, it's pretty easy to to follow that through and to, <laughs> you know, you just say like, okay, well, start again. Can you tell me how you did this, how you did that? And it'd be pretty easy to see who has worked out how temporal physics works and time travel and who hasn't. Um, in which case I would probably ignore them. Um, uh, I'll give them a, no, I'd, I'd ignore them. You hate the catch in your voice, though you're inwardly pleased at how the Vance's expressions show that you've managed to annoy the overprivileged, overprivileged pair. Dean Mean lets an uncomfortable silence fill the room. You look away, your eyes alighting on the pretentious photo of the Dean with the university president. The state's governor and the other bigwig politicians politicos. After an eternity, he points to an unpadded wooden chair. Sit down, Lindsay. You do. You're about to open your mouth when the Dean's next words pummel you. You stroll in here 40 minutes late. After having the audacity to ask for a passing grade, you were caught red-handed turning in your classmate's work at zero. He gestures to your enemy who smirks at you. Lindsay, you've committed a grave violation of our academic code of conduct. What do you have to say for yourself? He's wrong. His unfair accusation unleashes a storm of indignation within you. Shake my head. I'd never have the nerve to plagiarise, even if I wanted to. Go poker-faced. I used to cheat, but I don't risk it anymore. Scowl. I didn't cheat this time. Anyway, all my classmates cheat. Ah, oh, it'd be so, it'd be so easy. It'd be so easy to prove. Uh, hello, Trudon. No, you're not too late. Um, you've got to decide where this is going, though. Like, the, the whole concept of this is that the, the audience is to decide. So just give me a one, two, or three. See what you, how you want the story to progress. I mean, all you've missed so far is that, uh, you know, we We've been accused accused of plagiarism, and uh, we've just had a bit of a rubbish day, really. And hopefully at some time soon, I mean, we've been going for like half an hour, hopefully sometime soon there'll be a time machine and some T-Rexes involved. So, yeah, and the rivals are not a very nice person who's stolen our work and then blamed us for stealing theirs. And I'm getting the feeling that they're not going to believe us. So, um, one, two, or three, probably one. I've never, I've never plagiarized anyone's work. Hopefully do it all yourself. Yes, it's true that you're inherently too cautious to cheat in school. Uh, we're so much aware, so much is at stake, but obviously Dean Green and Professor Thorne have bought into Vance's story and that upsets your composure. The office suddenly feels dreadfully hot. Silence reigns as everyone stares at you. Vance Senior's face has turned into a mask of smug contempt, through Darian's exp though Darian's expression is one of curiosity. We're waiting, says the Dean. Your academic career hangs in the balance. So does your hope of obtaining an entry-level job in your chosen field. An entry-level job? I've invented a time machine. I've... Ugh. Well, if you do have evidence, uh, solid evidence of someone else plagiarizing, don't hesitate to be a snitch. Yeah, totally. Someone has copied your theoretical physics, and yeah, it's it's so easy to prove. But whatever. Okay, so uh, apparently we're picking three. <laughs> so we're just gonna whip a camera out. Whoa! Why can't I choose that one? It's not letting me choose three! It's all greyed out! Oh, that sucks! Okay, so all we've got to do is apologise and uh, work through the lab book or challenge Darian and prove that he knows nothing about his project. Uh, so, we need a, we need another <laughs> one quick. Um, I think it would be best to show your working out because that's that's easiest to do you cluck 
You clutch your temporal physics notes and stare at the throbbing vein in the Dean's forehead. Everything you're about to say has flown from your brain. Struggling, you begin. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be so late. Your apology sounds uh, perfunctory, even to your own ears, and it's met with stony silence from all quarters. Nervous, you hurry on. But I did my own work, and I can prove it. This lab book contains every last one of my conceptual breakthroughs, Professor Thorne. Her face is impassive, while the others are incredulous. No matter, you pop your lab book on the oversized desk. Your tabs have come off, and some ink has smeared on the remaining ones. It's right around here, you mutter, paging through it, but you can't seem to locate the pertinent passages where you derive the key temporal physics uh, principles. I also have my notes translating my proof of concept into... They must be here. Well, never mind. I can explain my breakthrough. The vein in Dean Green's forehead pulses more strongly as he makes a gesture of impatience. Two sentences into your explanation, you mistake one of the fundamental concepts you used in your work, identifying temporal windows, brief periods during which time travel is possible. Professor Thorne shakes her head. Darian Vance chuckles. You try to correct your mistake, but stumble. Worse yet, you begin to doubt yourself. Ah, oh, this is just academic imposter syndrome. It's so horrible. You know, you, you just... <sighs> okay, being, being a paleontologist, like, I know so much of, you know, like, incredibly specific field that so very few people in the world do. But if you ask me to explain it, I, my brain just goes blank. I just get it all wrong. I just stumble over everything. So I, I can understand uh, where she's coming from. Oh, the pressure is just too much. I hate it. I've nearly completed a working prototype. Uh, I mean, I'm well on my way to completing. Uh, Dean Green, shouldn't you have that vein looked at? Darian Vance can't help but snicker. Dean Mean raises his full six feet four inches and presses both fists into the blotter on his desk. His knuckles go white. Do you think this is a joke? He roars. His mind blanks on any possible response. Oh, your mind blanks on any possible response. You stare down intently at the ornate carpet in front of your eyes. Well, do you, Lindsay? You can barely manage to get out two words. No, sir. He points a beefy finger at you. I am hereby expelling you for cheating. Effective immediately, my decision is final. Gulp. Well, that sucks. So we've been kicked out of uni. And I suppose it really matters. You know, as soon as you get a time machine, you could just, like, turn up, like, oh, any time. Oh. You're going to have a time machine. You're going to get proofs right. It's all fine. Uh, wait, what? You walked in here to get that F changed to a passing grade you deserve, and now you've just been expelled? Seriously? Is Dean Mean even allowed to do that? Professor Thorne rises and takes your arm, tugging you towards the door. Her icy hand grips the like iron as she hisses, Don't make this harder for yourself than it has to be. You're so stunned that you're speechless. Trembling with indignation, you avoid all eye contact. The instant she lets go, you flee from the room. So we just ran home. Great. Cretaceous landfall. Uh, do we want any other music? Sure. For months, the memory of that dreadful day when you were expelled, the worst day of your life, rises unbidden to trouble your sleep and muck your waking hours. You replay it in your head a thousand times, trying to discern what you could have said or done differently. How else do you spend your time? Solo wilderness hikes and half marathons, neglecting filmmaking and the time machine. I watch some nature films endlessly, gaining some insights and 10 pounds. Or I reconfigure my time machine, neglecting all exercise. I think having just been booted out of uni, I will have to either take some time or prove myself right. I think it would probably be proving myself right. So I'm going to show him. You retreat to your parents' garage. 
where you stare fixedly at your schematics and tools as well as the half-built time machine itself, searching for solutions to seemingly trace intractable problems. You had thought you were so close until your confidence was badly eroded. The memory of Dean Mean's scorn and your humiliation torments you, making it hard to concentrate. In the end, it's Brett who saves you. One day, he shows up at your door wearing a goofy Triceratops hat and cap, three horns bobbing about, and you have to laugh and invite him in. I got you one too. Brett makes out, <laughs> takes out an even sillier cap. Its elongated brown brim resembles the wide muzzle of a hadrosaur. Two eyes adorn the cap's crown beneath its green top, which is meant to in- imitate the curved bony crest of some duckbills. Here, put it on. You do so, to humour your friend. Pulling out a bottle of wine, he says, Hey, remember how we wanted to go see the dinosaurs more than anything? You make a face as you pour a couple of glasses. I still want that, but... Yeah, you throw up your hands. It's hopeless. No, it isn't. Sure, it's a crazy hard problem, but solving it would be so worth the effort. He holds up a glass. Here's the time travel. To time travel, you echo, clinking glasses, not feeling it. It seemed like you were so close, Lindsay. I thought so too, but... But those bastards did a number on you. Brett's quivering with indignation on your behalf. And then your friend does a remarkable thing. Gently, patiently, by the time you two have finished the bottle, Brett persuades you to dig out your schematics and tools and try that modification you'd come up with. A fresh start. How's everyone doing on this Friday? Good, Eris. How are you? We're just trying out something a little bit different on here. I mean, it's so weird that we've got, like, an audiobook when, when you know, like, everyone's just generally just shooting dinosaurs. We are playing a game where, well, I guess we'll probably shoot dinosaurs as well, but at least we'll do it with just with text. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're having a good day. Fossil Friday. You set to work the next morning. Bit by bit, the technical challenges intrigue you once again. Let's face it, they do deserve to drive out the memory of that horrible day, at least temporarily. They're trickier than you'd envisioned, but Brett simply won't let you give up. At last, you make real progress. He orders the precision clock mechanisms and solar cells, as well as the fastest, smallest, most powerful computer he can afford for serious, real-time number crunching. Finally, finally, time travel is within your grasp. Today, you'll achieve the premier technological feat of the century. Of the century? Probably of all time, I think. As, <laughs> yeah. You take a couple of steps back to admire the glowing green lights on your softly humming time machine. You did it. The long hours holed up in your parents' chilly garage with the winter winds trilling outside while you retrofitted dad's high mileage Land Rover have paid off. You've taken your dad's Land Rover? You look at Brett who is grinning like mad. Simultaneously, you both whoop with joy, high five each other and do an important, impromptu, important as well, happy dance around the mustard coloured vehicle. A mustard coloured old Land Rover is the time machine. Well, sure, why not? Brett digs out something from his backpack. I have a surprise for you. He pops the cork on a bottle of champagne. There's a lot of drinking wine. You both take a celebratory swig or two straight from the bottle, then splash a bit on the Land Rover time machine to christen it. As you do so, Brett says, this time machine needs a name. What's your response? Uh, What are we calling it? (laughs) Using this as a background sound. I, I couldn't work to me talking about research. About research, about nothing, whilst you're researching. Um, so, we need a name, we need a name. Uh, my dad already called uh, the Land Rover Betsy. How about the McFlyer? Nah. It has to be the way, way, way back machine. Hmm, I'm going to call it... Uh, we're going to have to call it something custom. 
what's a good name for a Land Rover? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. No, not Other Lands Rover. Have you read Other Lands? That's a great book. Thomas Halliday is really good. I recommend it. Uh, the that time changer potato. Yeah, sure. That time changer potato. Whoa, what's happening with my caps lock? With that out of the way, where's some more music? Let's have some mystery music. With that out of the way, you can hardly wait to take Brett out for a spin. All the way back to the age of dinosaurs. Thankfully, temporal physics proves that there's no possibility of messing with anything in the present, no matter what you do tens of millions of years ago in the past. To put it bluntly, the butterfly effect is a myth, something science fiction writers dreamed up. With the time travel apparatus taking up so much space in the back of the Land Rover, you had to remove the rear seats, converting it into a two-seater. You need to be creative in cramming food and supplies in every available nook and cranny. Extra gas cans and a couple of spare tires go on the roof, together with a tank of propane in case the wood in the Cretaceous is too damp for a cook fire. Since there'll be no stopping at a convenience store if you forget your sunglasses, you must make trade-offs as to what's absolutely necessary for seven, eight, or nine days of roughing it in dinosaur territory. What do you bring? Uh, well, it looks like the first one's greyed out, so we're not taking a tent rifle and ammo. We're not an adventurer, so the choices we've taken of uh, um, meant that we can't go down that route. So we can take a helmet, flak jacket, and a thorough first aid training. I don't own a gun and don't shoot. A tent, a helmet, and a pistol that can fire ammo or blanks. I can perform basic first aid. Uh, I think you would probably have to... If you're going back to the Cretaceous, you're going to have to take a gun. I mean, I don't own a gun and I don't shoot things, but when I went to field work somewhere where we needed to be protected from, you know, like the wildlife, I did take a gun. I was trained in how to fire, fire rifles and stuff, and that was in case there were polar bears. So, tent, helmet, pistol, uh, and basic first aid, I think that is pretty sensible. You always strive to make the best decision even when it's unclear whether to take bold action or to exercise caution. That's not a bad way at all to face the unknown. Not surprisingly, your best friend brings his new rifle. Tucked in your bag will be a few of your favorite inspirational quotes. Why, why are we taking quotes? I mean, anything that you do in the past that you record with our, uh, with our camera is gonna be an inspirational quote. You know, you are going to be the one making inspirational quotes in future. Uh, Gandhi, the embodiment of unselfish... Uh, Gandhi, the embodiment of unselfish compassion. Uh, Machiavelli, the ultimate realist. Mark Twain and Will Rogers, those masters of humour. Intrepid explorers like Jacques Cousteau, Edmund Hillary and Amelia Earhart. I think maybe the last one is... Um, is going to be the best. So mystery music is a bit loud. Turning that down. That was good feedback on the audio. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're 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 going to come up with some uh, intrepid explorer-like quote. I think that's probably the best. You're hoping that these iconic examples of tenacious courage will keep you going and bring you safely home. It takes you the better part of the evening, but eventually you and Brett have sorted through the sea of equipment strewn all over the garage floor and crammed a small portion of it into that time changer potato just in time to. I love it how it's still got all the caps wrong. Boo, you say, 10 minutes to midnight. That's when the time window opens. 
My cell phone says 12 minutes before midnight. He looks worried. Hey, it doesn't matter. We have an entire half hour window. I've told you that. I know, I know, but this is our last chance at it for months and months. Brett runs a hand through his hair. That's true. Time travel to the late Cretaceous, 67 million years ago. It depends on complex calculations of time and space. You've only identified three launch windows this year, and two of those already happened before you got that time changer potato up and running. You think I'd be late? Me? That produces a little smile. It feels good to be able to joke about this. And anyway, a unique orange shimmer will surround the time machine, thereby alerting you when the time window is open. Let's get the camera rolling. What final preparations do you make for your historic departure? I comb my hair, don a clean camo vest, and check the lights and camera. I pack materials to make field notes, maps and sketches, triple check the time machine screens, or do a once over of everything, my appearance, the time machine settings, and the camera and lights. Uh, two or three. Uh, I think, I'm not too bothered about what I'm gonna look like. So let's, uh, let's go for two. We just, we just wanna make sure that we are gonna go back in time successfully, I think. Uh, for everyone else turning up, we are going through this audiobook together. Audiobook? Um, ebook together. Computer game book? I don't know how you choose, uh, what you'd describe it as. But it's Choose Your Own Adventure. Stick in the comments one, two, three, and we will go for what the majority think. For someone who's about to make history, you look a little uh, wild hair and rumpled. But who cares? What's important is that your time machine is well provisioned with many notebooks, pens and pencils. Its lights, humming noise and readouts all assure you that everything is ready as possible for the scientific expedition of all time. You've rigged the Land Rover to play our loud one minute warning before the time window opens. It blasts through the garage and probably wakes up half of your suburban garage. Oh, do I have to do this? So it either goes, Aruga, 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 or Yabba Dabba Do. It plays the Doctor Who theme song, or David Bowie's Space Oddity. I don't like any of those. The dinosaurs won't be impressed with that look. Thanks, uh, Blackadder. Um, okay, everyone wants one, so it's going Aruga a lot. Brett's a wide-eyed bundle of nerves. Who can blame him? On impulse, you grab the silly duckbill dinosaur cap that he gave you and put it on. The hat makes Brett smile. As you settle into the driver's seat and bu buckle up, your pulse is racing. With a trembling hand, you run through the pre-flight procedures. The flux navigator's green light slow, uh, glows steadily. The time machine keeps humming. All systems are go. Brett confirms it. You press the launch button and the garage disappears. Uh, Trudan, you were too slow. You need to get right as soon as you see the option. You're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to say which option you want straight away. But anyway, we're in a time machine. The garage has disappeared. We're going back to the late Cretaceous. And got a sound effect. One second the garage is right outside the windshield and the next second your time machine is surrounded by an inky darkness broken up by purple ripples. Now oh, we need some spooky music as well. Um, all is dead quiet save for the humming of your equipment. There's no sensation of motion though you experience an unsettled feeling in the pit of your stomach. Is this an effect of surfing the time stream or simply your own nervous anticipation? The chronometer on the console between the seats counts down the, third, uh, the six minute trip. You place your hands on the steering wheel out of habit. It moves freely as though it isn't connected to anything meaningful. Although that's what you expected because you're using autopilot for the voyage out. It still feels wrong. 
Now there's five minutes and 30 seconds to go. You make good use of your time. You monitor all the readouts and record their values. You crack jokes and reassure Brett that everything is going as expected. Or you film yourself and Brett on our maiden voyage. Yeah, everyone, everyone, we're all in agreement. Like, you, you need to film this, I think. Because that is going to be so useful to, to show everyone what it looks like. Or, or would you have more in the readouts? I mean, it depends on what kind of instrumentation, instrumentation you take. But hopefully they're all being recorded anyway, so let's, let's, um, let's film. At first, Brett's biting his lip nervously. Somewhere around 25 million years ago, he re relaxes and starts chuckling whilst, while looking pointedly at your head. In the middle of your explanation of what the Flux Navigator does, you realise that you're still wearing that ridiculous Hadrosaurus cap. You can feel yourself relax, happy to share a light-hearted moment with your best friend. But does it project the right look on camera? No. Remove it and restart my scientific explanation of time travel. Maybe, if it's endearing, I'm going for a heartwarming film. Yes, here's hoping it'll be hilarious moment, a uh, hilarious element for a comedy. Definitely, it'll look like a regular person in an action movie. The neogene is the scary part. Once you're past that, everything is downhill. What's in the neogene? I mean, I only know it from microfossils, so <laughs> I couldn't tell you all the big things, but uh, I can I can tell you in incredibly excruciatingly boring detail what's in the neogene. Uh, but I guess that we're going to be looking at dinosaurs and stuff, not what the foraminifera are doing. Um, so I think that. I think it's important in science communication to be able to show that you're, you know, like a, a, a normal person. You know, there's, there's a lot of issues around science communication of people with um, that uh, BBC accent, uh, all posh, all uh, middle class. And, you know, you need, you need to be able to show that science is for everyone, really. And I, I should probably be using my regular Mancunian accent. You're right, mate. Um, so, yeah. We're going for... It's endearing. We've left the hat on by mistake. We're... we're yeah. We're real people. Uh, catching a glimpse of it in the rearview mirror, you worry that the cat looks stupid and distracting. Does it work, you ask? Not so much. You take it off and start over. But two sentences in, time's up. The final seconds elapse. Brilliant sud sunlight floods that time changer potato. The back of the Land Rover drops uh, alarmingly, slamming your head into the headrest. Your vehicle settles at a troubling slant. An agonizing shriek reverberates through the vehicle. You twist around to see a grayish blue, leathery wing filling the rear window. You stick your head out of the side window. That wing is big enough to wrap around the side and the back of the Land Rover, and part of it is badly mangled beneath that Time Changer Potato's rear wheels. The creature's other wing is free. Uh, someone should have uh, come up with some uh, wing sound effects, you know? Hmm. Pterosaurs. And your eyes follow its stilt-like legs up to its compact torso, and up some more to its long, thick neck white and and as wrinkled as an old man's skin and up yet further to the beak pointed at you like a yellow sword above that two round black eyes filled with pain and desperation fix on you a pterosaur you exclaim and what we ran it over straight away uh that's not some kind of elite thing real people not robots lol so, before you can get out, oh, we're we're in the Cretaceous. We need some different music. Uh, before you can get out, uh, another world, oh, another word. It whips its red-crested head back and forth, its toothless beak agape. 
gulping for air as it deals the Land Rover a blow with its one good wing. Your vehicle shudders and settles at a steeper pitch. At the same time, quick-witted Brett reaches around behind the seat for the rifle he stashed there. He loads it and tries to open his door, but something is blocking it. Uttering a second shriek of desperation, the pterosaur uh, whacks the passenger side of the Land Rover hard. Your vehicle lurches to the side before coming to rest. Brett pushes on his door again. No luck. He hands you the gun with a brief aim for the eye and be super careful. Oh, this is horrible. You hesitate. The pterosaur deals the Land Rover a third blow. You got this, Lindsay. Gripping the rifle, you practically crawl out of the Land Rover, keeping down. The injured pterosaur watches you intently, cannily, despite its obvious pain. It pants, giving you a face full of foul breath. Its one good wing convulses. I summon, I summon my courage as I take my first trophy. I have to end its suffering, prevent it from damaging the time machine if it hasn't done so already. I must keep it from harming us, so I stay well back as I shoot. I won't shoot any living thing. Stay inside and capture its final, final moments on film. None of these options are particularly nice. Um, could be a lot of those things. Are those all different types of pterosaurs? Because I don't have a clue about pterosaurs. So, so you, you've come, Trudon, with all of this pterosaur knowledge, and then you're just like, yeah, but shoot it, please. So let's, yeah, we're just gonna blow its brains out. You switch off the safety, raise the rifle to your shoulder and aim. While you hate to prolong its agony, a misplaced shot would be way worse. Unfortunately, its whimpering wrecks your concentration. You rush, rush the shot and miss it completely. Brett clambers out the driver's door and motions for you to step aside. The pterosaur rises its, uh, raises its free wing once more. Taking the rifle from you, he finishes the job with a well-placed shot through that big black eye. Oh, great. The pterosaur's body spasms. That impossibly long neck arcs back. Its wings drop. The stilt-like legs pitch to one side. The great flyer crashes to the ground. With one less dreadful cry that reverberates through your soul, its pain has ended. You let out a long breath as your adrenaline rush ebbs. Now that this is over and done with, a bunch of competing thoughts and feelings mill around inside your head, each one trying to outshout the rest. There is one that you keep uh, coming back to that resonates the most with you. I can't believe he killed it. F in the comments for this pterosaur. Oh god. Like that that's the first thing we've done. We've got back to the Cretaceous and we've just shot a pterosaur through the eye. I feel horrible. I, I do feel horrible for causing the death of this noble beast. I need time by myself to examine the land uh, landing site selection algorithm and prevent this from happening again. The pterosaur's death is regrettable, but it's a small price to pay for my breakthrough. Thank goodness Brett and I are safe. My one regret is that I didn't have the composure to film and narrate its demise. Oh, that would be brutal. Here in the Cretaceous, we have landed on a pterosaur. It's not the landing that we wanted to have, but we'll see as it slowly dies in front of our own eyes as we watch with horror at its last moments in time uh no we couldn't do that uh so what are we feeling one two three four or five i think um, if it's me i mean one definitely two uh, is, uh you can do that later because you're not going to be going back anytime soon Th i mean three yes i do think it is a small price to pay through inventing time travel but, yeah. Uh, what's the music right now? The music stopped. You can have some more if you want. I've got, I've got like 
eight tracks that I've set up on a soundboard. So this one is just kind of like outdoorsy. Um, to be honest, arriving in a new place, immediately running over and shooting wildlife you've never seen before is pretty in line with most previous explorers. Yeah, um, although we should probably also eat it as well afterwards. Uh, someone just comes by a pterosaur fossil with a shotgun bullet in it. Yeah. Well, we, we'd have to like chuck it in the bottom of a lake or something and make sure that it actually gets preserved. Um, but yeah, um, not, not a great start to our time travel adventure, but I suspect it's probably going to get worse somewhere along the line. But um, yeah, so um, we, we are going to say that it's regrettable, but a small price to pay. You didn't, I mean, what are the odds of that pterosaur being there? I mean, if you think about the, the density of birds, in modern times, there, there's birds everywhere. But if you were to just like pop into any space uh, randomly, you're not going to land on a bird unless you're incredibly lucky. I think this is just incredibly bad luck. Sorry to the pterosaur. Um, should we have shot it? Um, can they can they live with a broken limb? Well, I'll have to ask a pterosaur person whether or not there's any, like, healed, um, bones, but I, I suggest, like, I, I expect that if you broke a pterosaur's wing, it's pretty much dead. So, anyway, sorry, sorry, pterosaur, but, you know, we've just invented time travel, so can't be feeling too bad. Attaining, tri uh, attaining time travel, like many technological advances, entails considerable risk. These risks out are outweighed many times over by the improvements to our lives that can be achieved. You didn't set out to deliberately destroy the pterosaur, and you couldn't have predicted its death. Hey, look at this! Uh, hey, look at this! Brett's gone to the front of the Land Rover and is staring at something. You circle around to join him, only to be brought up short. Before the right tire, uh, the front right tire, blocking the passenger door, lies a second prehistoric flat. Oh, a second one? Uh, uh, are we run over two? It has the same sword-like beak as the first one, though it's considerably smaller and lacks a head crest. Dark blood from one of its crumpled wings has gushed onto the bumper, and splatters glisten across one mustard yellow fender. We've killed two! You gape at its closed eye and inert form as silence descends, wishing you could redo your arrival, if only it were possible. Oh, if you had like a time machine or something. Uh, the laws of temporal physics dictate that you can never revisit any, oh right, okay. Re never revisit any time and place you've ever been before, including anywhere you've ever lived. You just get one shot at existing in any given set of space-time coordinates. No paradoxes allowed. No coming back here five minutes before today's arrival, or five days, or five years for that matter, with the intent to stay here until today. Setting the time machine to do so will produce a slew of blinking red lights and error codes. Here's the great irony of actual time travel. It permits no do-overs, no Groundhog Day. I crouch down to examine how it differs from the bigger one. I turn away, saddened that two pterosaurs lie dead. I keep my distance as I prepare to snap a few photos. What are we doing? Yeah, it is uh, interesting that they have potential sexual dimorphism. Or what What would two different pterosaurs be doing in the same place? Um... <laughs> I never realised we basically did the Wizard of Oz. Yep. Yep. Um, the story is like, shame on you for time travelling. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've invented time travel. This should be a happy story. We've made it back to the Mesozoic. This should be happy. And yet we've just killed two pterosaurs in the space of one Land Rover. Um, all right, so we are three. I keep my distance as I prepare to snap a few photos. Yeah, for posterity, this is good. 
It's important to get these shots as soon as you can. That's what a professional does without getting caught up in the moment. Lindsay, heads up. Brett shouts. Oh, no. Brett, be professional, please. You look up from fiddling with your camera as the pterosaur lunges for you. Oh, no, he's, he's telling us to watch out. I thought he was saying, like, hey, get in this photo. You look up from fiddling with your camera as the pterosaur lunges for you, wing claws extended. Okay, I got my pterosaur noises back out. It's an eagle. Yeah, it's got wings as well. Yikes, you leap to one side. Who knew it could play dead? Or was it merely stunned? Ouch, one of the claws rakes your arm. You tear out of there, pulling the Land Rover, putting the Land Rover between yourself and the attacker. Blood droplets seep between your fingers as you clutch your injured arm. Thankfully, it isn't anything more than a flesh wound. You'll ask Brett to tweet, treat your injury later. Meanwhile, Brett's uh, not one to let his best friend get attacked without doing something about it. He backs off and drops to one knee, finishing the pterosaur with one precisely uh, placed shot that echoes from the cliffs rising on the far side of the adjacent lake. Okay, so that is two pterosaurs dead now. Uh, so we snapped a few photos of the pterosaur he killed. Uh, could only go back however long before you, be, uh, you can time travel. Leave an alarm clock set for 10 seconds before you arrived and scare those pterosaurs just before you land. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing this story isn't going to allow us uh, to think about this too much. Just We're just going to have to go with it. Uh, I would think it would try to escape rather than stick around. Yeah, yeah you know, you, you expect it would. You, you don't expect it to be all like... Um, scheming was it was it stunned was it playing dead anyway let's have some mysterious music it takes some effort uh, with you and brett working together to drag the carcass of the smaller pterosaur out of the way of the land rover so that you'll be able to drive off the dead flyer must be a couple hundred pounds and those floppy leather light wings are cumbersome to maneuver while you do uh, so you say today has given me a lot to sort through it isn't like I'm at a zoo where I can admire, uh, safely admire the sheer size of those flyers. I wasn't at all prepared for their strength and speed or their cunning, their unpredicti uh, to unpredictability. Uh, yeah, so it is cunning. Hmm. Plus their incredible reach. Shooting them is a whole different ball game than that Rattler yes last year. I think you're right, you say. Brett's always known that you're no hunter and has never pushed uh, you to take it up just as you never tried to get him to stop hunting now you have to wonder how you'll react if thrown into another crisis Brett deserves to be able to count on you next you commence a more careful inspection of your vehicle thankfully nothing looks damaged hmm says Brett eyeing branches and detritus heaped in an arching mound surrounding the area I get it. That time changer potato landed in the middle of their nest. Oh, we killed baby ones as well. Please don't have killed baby ones. You look around more closely and realize your best friend is right. The nest is ridiculous. Almost as big as your friend's small apartment. Wow. Well, that makes sense, as the larger flyer must have been twice your height with a 20-foot wingspan. A dozen yards from the nest, a shallow stream feeds the lake. The shoreline is passable for some way. Tall pines march up the hillside. A breeze brings the crisp, woodsy scent of the forest to your nostrils, which is a refreshing change from the odour of the nest. The sun shines high over the lake, turning its waters silver. Though um, you left at midnight, the laws of temporal physics require you to arrive at midday. Yeah, very cunning. Uh oh, where am I? I hope we discover a third pterosaur you ran over landing, and the game's story is just an ever escalating tale of landing on pterosaurs. I like it. 
I'm sorry, I've got to make the joke in reference. You see, that Tyrannodon is just like the Indoraptor, very cunning. I've never seen Jurassic World, no interest in it. Uh, yeah, we ran over more pterosaurs. No, not the babies. I mean, it, it, it hasn't told us about the babies. Why, why are the parents, presumably parents, in the nest if there's nothing in there? Maybe they're about to lay. Brett stares at the remains of the bigger pterosaur. We're really here, he says. Then, uh, uh, there were times I didn't think you could do it. Well, I'm certainly glad you kept your high opinion of my abilities to yourself. He poses for a couple of selfies in the back of that time changer potato, with the head of the pterosaur at his feet, and motions for you to join him. I'm big on selfies, and I'm excited to take some. All right, these photos will document our contribution to science. Ugh, I only do I do so only to prove we were here. No way, it's disrespectful to those poor unfortunates. I mean, we have just killed two pterosaurs. We've got the the Land Rover is stuck in a nest, and he wants to take selfies. It's Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would snap as many photos as I could to be able to, you know, like, document the science, so... Alright, these photos will document our contribution to science. Having studied zoology and paleontology, you recognise the necessity for these precise depictions of prehistoric specimens. Where would we be if great naturalists of centuries past hadn't made highly detailed drawings of exotic species that later became extinct? You pull up a dinosaur app on your smartphone and start thumbing through pterosaurs. None of them has quite the same beak or the fan-shaped red crest surrounding, uh, surmounting this one's huge head. This could be a whole new species. That gives you an idea. Well, I mean, these things aren't necessarily going to have the, the soft tissues preserved, but then I guess, like, how complete is the fossil record? There's probably going to be tons of new species that don't even make it into the fossil record that would have been around at the time. So sure, it could totally be a, a new species. Um, I wouldn't rely on an app though. Plot twist, the Land Rover wiped out the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the uh, end Cretaceous. Just a, a Land Rover landed and landed on top of everything. So, we've had an idea. I'm going to name it after myself. Uh, you can't... Can you do that? I think you can do it. I think it's just poor form. It needs a name, some combination of both our names. If it's a new species, it'll need a name. I won't know until I do a scientific analysis. Well, it's... Mm, scientifically, I would say it's got to be the last one. Yeah, and you're all agreeing, so that is good. Yeah, definitely something new. Yep, 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 new species, and we're going to do proper science on it. Brett looks a little disappointed, but says, makes sense, I guess. Yes, it does, Brett. Don't question us. We're paleontologists and also engineers. You take a deep breath and consider what to do next. Examine the time machine settings to find out why it crashed in the nest. Poke around the fishy stench in the nest for eggs or immature pterosaurs needing help. Um, use specimen bags to collect samples from the nest as I keep an eye on our surroundings. Or I've got so much to film and narrate. Um, do we want to save the pterosaurs? I mean, we just killed the parents. I think... I think these these are pterosaurs that lived many, 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 many years ago, but they're in our present now. But, like, if you were concerned with the saving of these pterosaurs and you have a time machine, what is to stop you saving all the other pterosaurs that died? I mean, okay, yeah, we caused it, I guess. 
I think I think if it was up to me, I would be most concerned with collecting evidence. I mean, there's so much cool stuff that'd be in like a pterosaur nest. Like there'll be remains of food, there'd be any sort of like hair fibers and eggshells and stuff like that. Uh, where are we up to? Another question. Do you consider it taboo for a scientist to name a species after somebody important to them? Example, a significant other's maiden name. Ooh, I wouldn't do it myself. I, I think it's always the case that a lot of uh, species that are named after people would be people who have facilitated or are involved or have a history of study in that area. Um, naming it after celebrities and naming it after um, significant partners and stuff. That is, mm, it's not the it's not the greatest, I don't think, because you're taking something that you know like lived. It's a whole lineage. It's it's an important group, and you're just it kind of feels like it detracts from it. And and I had a, a paleocast interview where I actually discussed a lot of the rules of how you name these things. Uh, it's the International Commission on Zoolo Zoological Nomenclature. And we discussed the rules, like what are you allowed to do and what aren't you allowed to do. And the strict rules are so incredibly uh, lax. that I, I thought it was really strict, but it's kind of like a self-governing of science and, and how we name things. Because the guy was like, you can you can pretty much name it anything that you want to. There's, there's nothing to say that you can't. Uh, the only things that aren't allowed are, and this blows my mind, is naming the same thing twice. So you know like how a, a mouse would be called like Mus Mus. You can't do that anymore. You're not allowed to do that. And I was just like, what? That That's, that's your hill to die on. And I said, like, is it, could you, could you name, you know, like your, your new species after um, someone, you know, like in 1930s, 40s Germany, you know, like any leaders of their country? And he was like, yeah. And he was, he was thinking like, um, they've not actually come up with rules as to whether or not you could name it as a code so you have a species that is called like uh, JFT86-4 whether or not that would be allowed and so there's there, there are like surprisingly few rules as to what you are and aren't allowed to do so anyway um, you have the choices to save the baby pterosaurs or add up the pterosaur body count I want to add to the pterosaur body count. I want to see how high we can get this. Uh, behold, Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, a brand new species. Not allowed. Nope. Uh, like 70% of modern genera have at least one species name that's the same as the genus. Yeah, so I think they, they might have stopped that. I don't know. Go. We, sh we should all go and listen to the Paleocast episode that I've completely forgotten about. So anyway, we're, we're, we're collecting data. You're good at multitasking like this. You scoop up some remains uh, from both pterosaurs and their nest material. You get some samples of those fibrous membranes that make up their feather-like wings, and also the fine hair-like filaments coating their foreshortened torsos. So we've got hairs, not feathers. Uh, their broken wing bones are hollow. Oh, we've pulled out a bone. And as thin as playing cards. You put several of their droppings in a sealed container. Isn't science glamorous? Even better, you spot a pale curved object poking up from beneath the nest. It feels squishy, parchment-like. An intact egg! Nearby are several more, but each of these is ripped open. Not cracked or broken. Oh, we haven't killed it. Suggesting that the offspring have already left the nest. The unhatched one doesn't smell so great. Nevertheless, you carefully bag it and pack it away while noting that the pterosaurs uh, situated their nest in close proximity to a large lake. 
While you're wrapped up, you catch a flash of movement and rustling in the woods. With terror-inducing screeches and a flurry of green-feathered bipedal dinosaur charges straight to you. Uh, we need some noises. Uh, they're only hip high, but those vicious curved hind claws are as long as your fingers. Trudontids, pack hunters, major bad news. Hollywood producers who thought dinosaurs couldn't look fearsome with feathers were so wrong. These predators, cousins of the velociraptors, a few generations removed, have more ferocity than an eagle and a mountain lion combined. They must have scented blood. Brett takes shelter inside the Land Rover. <laughs> Bye, Brett. Thanks very much. He just shuts the door. It feels like you're miles away from the safety of the vehicle. Worse yet, you're between the carnivores and the dead pterosaurs. You must act immediately. Uh, what are we doing? This isn't good. Uh, we need some clever girls. An omelette time. Mingin rotten omelette. Right. Uh, climb a tree, though it won't be easy, and film the drama unfolding below. We can't pick up their leader because uh, we don't have a gun and we're not a, a shooty, huntery type. I return to the safety of that time charger, uh, changer potato to film the true daunteds. Or sprint to the Land Rover, scare them with the horn, then drive away and hide in the woods. Uh, we need to be fast. What are we doing? Uh, question mark four, maybe three. Well, whoever wrote this probably dealt with uh, fanboys of certain movies. I don't doubt that for a second. Uh, three or four. Return to the safety of the um, time change potato and film them, or get on the horn and try to get rid of them. Are they going to change? Are, are they going to damage the time machine? I might try and drive away. Uh, we got more threes. We got more threes. We're going to film them. You impress Brett with your immediate response and your brave retreat to the Land Rover. He nods approvingly when you start filming the pterosaur's aggressive behavior. They all go for the choicest morsels of pterosaur flesh and belly organs, hissing and snapping at each other uh, all the while. Uh, dinosaur eating noises. You hear that? They're less a hunting pack than a mad horde, but they do enforce a strict pecking order. Ooh, that's interesting. The biggest truodontids with the longest crest feathers prevail. The smallest ones must settle for the leathery wings. Uh, you get some wonderful footage of the pterosaurs ripping into the uh, predators written, ripping into the dead pterosaurs. When they're done, they don't hang around. Uh, the mob takes off at top speed, which seems to be the only speed they possess. Wowzers! Their green and brown feathers vanish into the forest. You're safe, thank goodness. Phew, now that that's over with, you need to deal with your medical situation. Being a paramedic, Brett does a fine job applying an antiseptic cleanser to your wound and binding you up. Uh, this isn't the right music anymore. We'll go back to the nature one. Um, you watch closely to brush up on your own first aid techniques. He agrees it's okay for you to start on an antibiotic. Who knows what germs you may have picked up. You also pop a pain reliever. High overhead, a pair of tailless flyers, circles and circles. Through field glasses, you discern that they may have uh, much the same wing and head shape as the former occupants of this nest. Then again, they could be scavengers waiting for you to quit the scene. Speaking of scavengers, in light of your all too exciting encounter with the two true daunted horde, Brett offers to keep watch for signs of other hungry critters lurking in the dense foliage so that you can give your uninterrupted attention to your main interest. That's really thoughtful of him. Uh, I'll focus on a dead true daunted. We can't do that one. Grayed out. Never mind the dinosaurs. I make sure that the time change of potato is functioning at 100%. I don't have it in me to pick through the carnage. Let's go and explore. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Sorry, I I am getting the Monty Python references. <laughs> I'll just take a moment to laugh. Uh, when danger reared its ugly head, you turned about your tail and fled, bravely ran away, away. Who could a true 
uh, Don get um, leading poisoning? Could it treat that? Yeah. Lead poisoning. Start those bacteria on their antibiotic re resistance evolutions uh, early. Uh, they get a head start. Right, so three. We're, we're gonna go. We're gonna go explore. Get a head start. Oh, we got an achievement. Is that gonna turn up for you? Oh, you didn't see that. Hmm. We got an achievement. Where is it? Ah, oh, give it me. I can't see. Oh, I'll have to tell you what it is later. Um, this was not the historic landing you had envisioned. Seeing as Brett is looking impatient, you suggest heading on out. He's happy to drive. Uh, where's some car sounds? Let's get in the car. Seeing as Brett is looking impatient, you suggest on heading out. He's happy to drive. You wend your way along the lake shore, through the pines and over the uneven terrain, which makes it slow going. You both keep your eyes peeled for flashes of movement or other signs of wildlife. Coming around a point of land jutting out into the lake, you spot a trio of pterosaurs wading stalk-like in the blue water, their elegant forms catching the afternoon sun, their slender beaks dart to spear an occasional fish, while they toss down their long, stout throats. From time to time, they unfurl their great wings and crow as if to celebrate a tasty morsel. Only the largest of the three bears, uh, a crest on its head. Isn't it remarkable how graceful these enormous creatures can be, and how magnificent? The relationship between the three is puzzling, though. At first you presumed it was a parent, a mother, and most likely two offspring. Yet you've seen no sign that juveniles stay with parents until almost full grown. Watching them some more, you think it could be a large male with two female mates. Wouldn't it be incredible to film these living pterosaurs? Start filming them right here, relying on camera techniques to compensate for the distance. Approach on foot for better photos without disturbing them uh, if I hurry, or have Brett drive closer as I film out the window, then flash the headlights so they'll do something interesting. Well, this. The author, Rosemary Kyle Smith, she does not like pterosaurs. Uh, possibly an early start on air pollution. Lol. Uh, for run this one's over too. Uh, this is en entertaining. I'm having a good time. Thank you, chat. Um, so we are doing three? Is that one? No, we need to... Mm, I think we can... We can get close. We can do this. Heat or fatigue or both catch up with you. By the time you've trudged to take a decent spot and set up your equipment, the pterosaurs are done feeding and fly off. You have no more encounters with dinosaurs before it's time to set up camp for the night. With the sun setting... You build a crackling fire and watch uh, over which you roast the fresh fish that your best friend has reeled in. As you sort through the events of the most remarkable day of your life, nothing has ever tasted so good as this. The earliest fish that any human ever caught. And it's time for the next chapter. But, you know, I've been talking for an hour and a half and it really hurts. I've never done that before. Like, just solid talking. And, yeah, it hurts. So, what we're going to do is going to carry this on another day. Maybe tomorrow. It depends if everyone's about tomorrow or what. But this is this is this has gone better than I thought it would do. And hopefully people are going to catch up, and then they're going to watch tomorrow as well. So, I'm very happy with this. I'm very happy with uh, the engagement and uh, with the uh, Blackadder references as well. I think if I, uh, if it was hypothesis that the offspring of large pterosaurs take up the niche smaller pterosaurs, uh, rest in peace. I feel like they would see a lot more animals too, lol. Also the pterosaur hate. Yeah. Thanks for streaming. This was a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It is a bit of a worry, you know, like doing something computer gamey and then just turning up with a 
an ebook, really, and just hope that <laughs> it's going to be entertaining enough. Uh, if the, if there's anything else that we need in this, I can I can stick it in. Maybe some more like sound effects or uh, I don't know what what would work for you guys. Is there anything that's missing from this? I'll stick it in the next one. Um, if not, we'll just do some more. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. I've, I've enjoyed it. But I'm going to play Call of Duty all night now and uh, get some FPS action in. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining and we'll see you again tomorrow for some more maybe. Uh, Terrasaur hate ebook. <laughs> It was chill. Okay, well, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Um, and I'll see you tomorrow if you're about same time around about then. So uh, see you later.